I was at this show. There was a man, and his name was uh, Skeets Houchins. Skeets Houchins? Yes. It's like a movie. <laughs> so Skeets comes up to my table and says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm waiting for someone to stop, and I'm going to want to show them the prototype of my new type of pocket knife. And Skeets says, you can't do that. The people walking by, they're like zombies. They're in a daze. <laughs> they don't see anything. And you got to get up. You got to get out in the aisle. You got to grab them. You got to stop them. So I stood up. When people walked by, I'd say, You, sir, have you seen my new pocket knife? Then Cho and I said, Now what? What do we do with the rest of our lives? So this is around August of 1975. By August, the two of you decide, from, from what I understand, to, to travel, to backpack and hitchhike uh, in Europe and maybe even beyond. We wanted to, to experience other cultures, and, and in particular, the culture in Eastern Europe. By now, we decided that maybe the best way to, for us to travel would be to have our own car. And we heard that the easiest and best place to buy a car was in Amsterdam. Hmm. So we headed there. Uh, bought a $300 used car. It was a, a Fiat 600D, a 1969. If you can imagine a Volkswagen Bug uh, scaled down to two-thirds size, this was our, our little Fiat. All right, so you end up... Uh, back in, in Oregon, 1976, and you're flipping through your book of ideas, and you decide the most viable idea, the one you want to pursue, is this, this knife tool. Exactly. It was, had the most re realistic chance of uh, actually being able to do something with it. And I asked my wife, uh, could I build one, just one, just for me? She said, how long will it take? And I said, maybe one month. So she said, okay. And so she went to work to support us. Mm -hmm. And I went to, at the time we were at my parents' house, I went into the basement and picked up a file and a hacksaw and started trying to build what was in my mind. This was my day job. Every, every day I would uh, go to my brother-in-law's garage and yep. spend the whole day in the garage. And so uh, there was, I spent a lot of time in the library, too, All where right. I, when I was researching various aspects of materials or specifications on how good the tool should be. So it's 1978, and Tim Leatherman has been grinding away on a prototype for a folding multi-purpose tool. And his plan is to patent it, sell it to a big knife company, and make lots of money. And they would pay me about $1 million, and I would sit back and live happily ever after. By this point in the early 80s, I believe I read you had already received more than 100, maybe more than 200, either rejections or no replies from uh, knife companies and tool companies. But you still thought you were still holding on to this dream, even though you'd already had about 200 or more rejections or, or no replies. Yes, I still had the goal, still had the dream, still persevering. Why did you think that it was going to work if no one was confirming that idea? <laughs> There's a fine line between persistence and failure to accept reality. And I was determined to try to go on too long before giving up too soon. One day in late May of 1983, eight years after I had first thought of the concept, I got a letter at my business address, which was really my home address, 
I opened it up, and inside was a purchase order for $12,000. Wow. For, for 500 tools. So they weren't too happy, but they said, the 250 have been sold. Here's an order for 500 more. Wow. And a week after that, they called and said, the 500 are gone. Here's an order for 750. Uh, just to, I just want to point something out. This is the same company, Early Winters, who were supportive, who said, hey, try to make it cheaper. But at the same time, they were also skeptical that they could, that, that, whether they could even sell 250 of these things. Right. Two weeks later, they called back and said the order is now 1,000 tools. And then it turned out that the catalogs were all monitoring each other. And if they got a sense there was a hot product, then they all wanted on board. Of course. Of course. Then we started getting calls from all these catalogs that had turned us down before or, or hadn't even responded. They were saying, oh, this said we want yeah. this. Hey, yeah, they hey, call up and yeah. say, hey, we understand you have a new product. Would you mind sending us a sample? I love it. And Steve and I, rather than saying, you idiots, we sent you a letter. <laughs> you said no. You could have had an exclusive. You didn't even reply. <laughs> no, no, no. We didn't say that. We said, yes, sure. We'll be happy to send you a sample. So it's 1983, and after years in the wilderness, Tim Leatherman's multi-purpose tool is finally finding a market with mail-order catalogs. And sales? They start to grow. Like mad. Yes, it was, it was, by then it was quite evident that uh, there was a market for this tool. When we were able to go from 200 tools to, in 1983, to 1 million tools in 1993. Wow. Those were really exciting years and with growth rates of 50% per year compounded. I know, Tim, that at, at one point there was a, a lawsuit, a, a class action lawsuit against Leatherman um, because your tools were stamped made in the USA, even though some of the component parts were actually made in Europe or, or elsewhere, but most of it was assembled and made in the U.S., including most of the components. Um, anyway, I know there was a – it was based on, on an obscure law, this lawsuit. It was, it was a complicated legal back and forth, but the, but the upshot was – or the, the, the outcome was that you ended up taking Made in the USA off of your products. Yes. As, as a result, we – we're required to label our tools. A proper label in our tools could be made in the USA of U.S. and foreign components and assembled in the USA. Mm -hmm. Actually, that lawsuit, it could have spurred us to say the heck of it, we'll just go all the way and make our tool abroad. But the opposite happened. It, it spurred us into being more resolute and mm -hmm. seeking more domestic uh, su suppliers and adding even more f uh, U.S. content into our tools so that wow. we can, in most of our tools now, we can uh, label them as made in USA. We get testimonials of the Leatherman tool saving lives. We get testimonials of a, from Leatherman tools from a couple of soldiers who've said the Leatherman tool has stopped a bullet. We've received uh, testimonials of the Leatherman tool being used as a surgical instrument and saving a life in, a, in an emergency. We uh, ha have many testimonials of a Leatherman tool being used to rescue someone out of a burning vehicle. There's another one out of a, a, a fallen helicopter. There's uh, many, many, many uh, different markets that where everyone finds the Leatherman tool to be of great value. So, Tim, when you think about the, the journey you've gone on, right, you know, this, this is this kind of crazy story. I mean, we're toiling away on this thing that nobody wanted and and you're kind of like, you know, you had every reason to question 
why you were doing this. And everybody had a reason to question why you're doing this because it was not it was not rational. This was not selling. You were not making a product people seem to want because you weren't getting confirmation from the market, and yet you persisted. And it's a you know, hundred plus million dollar company today. How much of, of 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 this story do you think has to do with just your hard work and persistence and smarts? And how much do you think has to do with luck? I think that it's around ten percent luck and about ninety percent pluck. I've persevered. I've worked hard. I've I've had great people working with me. Obviously, I'm privileged to born into a life of privilege in the, in, in the United States and growing up in a middle-class household. I've been so many places in the world where life is not nearly as good as I've had it. There have been uh, things where in life where I've beaten the odds. The fact that uh, Leatherman Tool became successful of, of uh, products that are patented. I've read that only about 5% of or less of products that are patented that get on the market. Mm. So I feel like I've been a lucky person. I've never bought a lottery ticket because I feel like I've already beaten the odds and it's not gonna happen again.